In the latest of our lecture series devoted to the theme, Freedom, Roads to Freedom, we are delighted to welcome to the Lugato Institute Andrew Wilson, who will be talking about Shakespeare and Shakespeare's distinctive place on those roads to freedom. In this, the year that sees the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death. Andrew, you say, and I think absolutely correctly, that negative capability, that quality that John Keats ascribed to Shakespeare's at the heart of this mysterious but enduring appeal, negative capability, what do you think Keats meant by it, and why is it so relevant to William Shakespeare? Well, it's a difficult phrase, because uh, it isn't part of the ordinary currency of the English language. Keats invented it. He was writing to his brothers in 1817. He'd just been to see a magnificent production of Shakespeare with Edmund Keane, one of the famous Shakespearean actors of the day. And he said that uh, what at once struck me uh, was the quality which went to a man of achievement, especially in literature, which Shakespeare possessed so enormously. I mean negative capability. And then he went on to expound uh, the meaning of that phrase, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Um, it actually slightly reminds me uh, of the moment in Matthew Arnold's uh, writings where he ascribes to the Celt um, the ability to live without the despotism of fact. <laughs> but I don't think that, that is exactly what Keats meant. Yeah. What I think Keats meant was that all the characters in Shakespeare's plays are free to be themselves. And in a great number of the plays, particularly the problem plays, you find um, individuals, let's take Angelo in Measure for Measure, um, who is trying to assert chastity, while in himself being, of course, a tormented man of lust who is trying to persuade a nun to go to bed with him. Um, that is a very, very good example of Shakespeare and his negative capability at work. Because rather than being a play which says, you must be chaste or unfortunately none of us are chased. Instead, you, you observe this tension uh, in which Shakespeare is not laying down the law about anything. And it's not a kind of sterile notion of neutrality, is it, this negative? Treatment? It's very much not neutrality, and it's very much not uh, what Goethe thought he'd found in Shakespeare, amorality. Um, I think Shakespeare is, in fact, rather a firmly moral writer. Uh, he's not saying in Measure for Measure that uh, all the bawdy houses and brothels are good places to exist in, any more than he's saying that um, the absolute cruel insistence upon chastity by Angelo is a good thing. He's saying that we're all very confused human beings, but we should be guided by certain principles. Similarly, in Macbeth, um, although it appears at certain moments as if Macbeth, with all his wonderful poetry, uh, has somehow been released from morality, rather like Raskolnikov in uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Um, he hasn't been, of course. He gets his comeuppance. And murder uh, is not an acceptable thing uh, in Shakespeare's world. So there is, in fact, the very hard edge of morality. But it's set against the mixture and muddle and interest, which is the quality of being human. And it's not just a quality of variety as an ideal, as it were. Let's you know, explore lots of different ways of approaching this problem. It's an assertion of the variety and creativity of the human spirit seen through this prism. It's extraordinary, and it comes about at this mm -hmm. extraordinary moment in English history, when England in particular, I use the word England advisedly, of course, it's Great Britain, really. But, I, it, but it's a moment when Britain is finding itself as a totally independent voice in the world. Um, it's expanding overseas. It's uh, now got a, an independent liturgy and church which is detached from the great Western church. Um, and it's a new era uh, of humanity as far as English-speaking peoples are concerned. And Shakespeare is all the, in part of that. He, 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 the wind is in, in, in the sails of Elizabethan England and he's, he's absolutely on the prow of that ship. And when Elizabethan England becomes Jack Beer in England in 1603, it has a king who decides that he'd rather like to be called King of Britain. 
Absolutely. And he's told by the English Parliament, no, 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 James, I mean, you can't call yourself King of Britain. We want our English king. We want to be Rex Anglorum. But he, James did issue proclamations he did. using that title, uh, and of course, King of Britain. And, of course, Shakespeare's attitude to James is very, very interesting, because, I mean, what is it, um, 13 years of Shakespeare's life were spent as, uh, as a subject of King James I. Um, the early plays he wrote, which obviously reflect the arrival of James VI of Scotland in London as James I are very complicated plays. And they're, they're plays, I mean, for example, the play about the division of the kingdom in King Lear directly reflects the, the, the triple kingdom that James I takes over. Now, and uh, Macbeth, of course, is also... Now, unity, division. Uh, in your lecture, you talk about our periods in the early 21st century as being not really at the time of the end of history, uh, some preposterously called the 1990s, but rather a period that has witnessed the decline and the appeal of some savage ideologies, 20th century, of course, being the age of murderous ideologies, communism and fascism. But this has also been the period, early 21st century, that has seen an immense revival in Shakespeare, in Shakespearean productions, Shakespearean actors, more than ever now than, than I think in the comparatively recent past. Uh, what's the relationship between these two things, these two phenomena? I think they are related. I'm, I'm quite sure they're related. Uh, if you look at the history of Shakespeare in Europe, as opposed to Shakespeare in Britain or Shakespeare in the United States, um, you see Shakespeare being taken over by uh, ideologues, really over the last 200 years, um, particularly in the 19th century. Uh, in France, uh, Victor Hugo, uh, just before the July Revolution, wrote this play, which he considered to be very Shakespearean, called Hernani, and everybody believed it happened. It was uh, staged at the Comédie Française in 1830, February. And the July Revolution, which toppled the Bourbon uh, dynasty forever, was, uh, in many people's eyes, heralded by Victor Udo's play. And certainly when he wrote a book about Shakespeare later in his life, uh, Udo saw uh, Shakespeare as the great lefty on the barricades leading the revolution. And um, uh, Baudelaire wrote a very funny review of the book saying that Shakespeare had been a socialist without realizing it until he was told it by Victor Udo. Uh, Day on 70 years, the same theatre, Comédie Française, and there's a great production of Coriolanus, which was a fascist production, again causing riots. Um, now, of course, to us, it's utterly preposterous to think that Shakespeare was either uh, a fascist or a romantic uh, leftist communard. Um, but I think that his history in Europe has been very much engaged with the way other people, uh, Germans, French, Russians, looked at our great national poet, and they saw him uh, as a symbolic figure, as, a sum, uh, as somebody who stood for things which I think, uh, to many of our ways of looking at uh, life, simply aren't authentic and don't, don't convince at all. But, I mean, what's so interesting, uh, if you think of the story of Shakespeare in Germany, for instance, um, I begin my lecture, in fact, with the fall of the Berlin Wall. There was this great uh, production of Hamlet in rehearsal, during the rumbling moments when we can now see with hindsight communism was about to come to an end. And this production of Hamlet, which was all taking place in an ice cube, it was, it was called Hamlet de Machina, the, the machine, um, falls in brass at the end, comes on. The, the old ghost, by the way, is un unmistakably Stalin. Oh, bound to be. In yes. Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end, when Fortinbras comes on, he's a representative of Deutsche Bank and <laughs> the arrival of capitalism to liberate them all. So it's, a, it's very peculiar that Shakespeare's being used in this way. And I, you mention, hand in hand with that, the tremendous revival of what one could call authentic English productions of Shakespeare of all kinds, experimental, traditional, and so forth. Uh, in London alone, the building of the... Uh, Repro, Erzatz, um Globe Theatre by Sam Wanamaker, which has been hugely popular, not just as a tourist place, but as a place where, where Shakespeare can be explored, both in the Wanamaker Theatre indoors, these very small intimate productions, and the Repro uh, productions in the Globe itself. Almost every uh, theatre in Shaftesbury Avenue at some stage, it seems to me, has, has a production of Shakespeare on. When I was a boy, 
If you wanted to see Shakespeare, you had to be taken to Stratford-on-Avon or the Royal Shakespeare Company when it came to London. And there would be occasional grand productions at the National Theatre when that began. But now, Shakespeare is part of the common currency once again, as it was in Victorian England, where Shakespeare was always being performed. And I think one of the reasons for this, you mentioned the so-called end of history. Well, we can see, sadly enough, or happily enough, history hasn't ended. Uh, communism uh, itself hasn't necessarily uh, completely ended, but certainly the dramas of 1989-90, uh, the fall of the wall and all that, did not bring an end to world conflict and world ideological difference. It was just uh, the end of one particular chapter. And we now have this extraordinary uh, battle going on across the world between uh, American free capitalism, liberalism, whatever you may call it, and Islam. The rest of us rather caught in the, the firing line. And I think one of the reasons for the distrust of ideology and of doctrine, not only in politics but in religion and well. in so many other areas, uh, is precisely that uh, after the last 70, 80 years of horror in Europe with fascism, with communism and all the rest and the numbers, the sheer numbers who died and in China, of course, we actually fall with some rapture upon our great national genius, who, as Keats said, uh, had this quality of ne negative capability, and it wasn't towing a party line. A great human being uh, in communist days would have been somebody who was a good member of the party. Uh, a great human being in Nazi Germany was somebody who adored the Führer. And one can see now that that is sort of pathetic, subhuman notion of what humanity is. Yeah, that is fear, rather than And that than is freedom. fear. And that Shakespeare liberates us again to ask the most basic question of all, which is, what is it to be human? And in this, the 400th anniversary, what will live in the head in our Shakespearean celebrations will be Andrew's account of this matter. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, thank you, Howard.